thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Sarah McAnulty. I run the Skype a Scientist program. And today we are going to be talking about quite the controversial topic on the internet, the Tiger King with uh, big cat scientist Imogene. Uh, so this is going to be so fun and a little weird. And we're going to learn about tigers and it's going to be great. Um, just as a heads up, Skype a Scientist, for anyone who hasn't joined us before, we're a nonprofit organization that connects people with science in as many places as possible. And so um, if you can support our mission, we try to put out a lot of uh, diverse, cool content for everybody. Um, we also do matching where if you want to talk with any type of scientist, you can sign up at skypeascientist.com and we'll match you with uh, a scientist in the area of your choosing. So um, that's all free. All of our content is totally free for everybody, including the matching. Um, and if you can support us, we'd really, really appreciate it. We're completely donor supported. And you can do that at patreon.com slash skypeascientist or make one-time donations to uh, paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so all of the donations that you make to our program are tax deductible. So with that, let's do it. If you have questions throughout, submit them to the Q&A. Um, we are probably gonna have more than average people here today, so um, let's all try to be respectful and uh, only submit your question once. I will see it, but we probably won't get to everyone's questions today just because there are so many folks here. So, um, yeah, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, am I live? You're, oh, totally. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Uh, <laughs> my name is Imogen Cancellari. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware. I'm currently coming to you from my kitchen table in Delaware, as I'm sure most of you are probably at home in various stages of pajamas, um, which is how I spend most of my time right now. Um, but I am doing my PhD research on the genetic connectivity of snow leopards uh, throughout Central Asia. But prior to working on this current project, I spent some time uh, working at a, an accredited tiger sanctuary on the East Coast of the United States. And so combined with my background, Background, a lot of people were talking to me about this docuseries Tiger King uh, and I initially wasn't going to watch it but I did and so if you're here that means that either you watch it too and you have some things to say or maybe you didn't read uh, watch it but you saw my thread online and basically we're gonna dive right in all right, so um, the way this is gonna work, I figured the best way to make this kind of cohesive is that I was going I'm basically gonna summarize some of the things that I think are wrong with Tiger King. Um, whether you watched it or not, I think the important takeaway here is that there's a lot wrong with Tiger King. I could go on and on and on about all of the issues with this docu-series, but I would like to basically summarize it into five different major thesis points, if you will. I'm um, discuss a little bit of the details surrounding that, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions, whether it's questions about points that I have made or points that I haven't made, we'll kind of have like an open-ended Q&A or discussion about what this means for both um, I guess television, as well as tigers in captivity and tigers in the wild. So if everyone's ready, buckle in. Uh, let's go ahead and get started for some of the nitty gritty of it. Um, so when I watched it, if you wa if you saw my thread online, um, I you know I tried to be a super ton in cheek about it. Uh, but I spent most of the documentary being really angry. Uh, it was a very difficult watch for me for a variety of different reasons. Primarily, I can kind of sum those up in terms of issues with animal husbandry, animal welfare violations, um, issues with the way that we portray real people as characters and kind of blurring the lines between um, credible facilities, but also credible people. And I think that the documentary had some really cool opportunities to uh, dispel a lot of these myths, but ultimately that it didn't, or ultimately it did not. Um, the first thing that I think is the most, well, I shouldn't say the most important because I think they're all important, but for the first point, I think that the thing that Tiger King missed is that specifically they did not discuss the problems surrounding private ownership of wildlife. Now, the sanctuary that I worked at was in North Carolina. And in the state of North Carolina, for example, you are not allowed to own a bobcat as a pet. Meaning that because it's an endemic, it's a, it's a natural animal in that part of the world, you're not allowed to own it as a pet. It's considered a wild animal. However, you can get a permit from the United States Department of Agriculture to own a tiger. And so the sanctuary that I worked at was essentially dealing with a lot of these problems where we saw private owners either surrendering or having their cats taken. And after they're taken, there's nowhere for them to go. And so the sanctuary that I worked at took those animals in. 
And so we'll get into some more of those details later, but realistically, what I saw was the end result of private ownership and Tiger, and Tiger King doesn't discuss any of the issues surrounding private ownership. Yes, I know the documentary was about private ownership and it glorified a lot of different things, but the reality is that the, the footage that we saw is ultimately the footage surrounding the unique issues that are happening every single day across the United States. Um, the first and most important thing is that when you have a private or roadside zoo, there is no regulatory body for the animal welfare, the husbandry, and specifically the unregulated breeding of tigers or any wild animal in captivity. Yes, Sarah. Can you tell us what the word husbandry means? Yes, sorry. Uh, thank you. Good question. Animal husbandry is effectively the care and veterinary uh, maintenance of any type of animal. So think of the livestock industry. We have specific laws that are designed to make sure the size of pens, how much food and water they have, what their type of shelter regulations might be, and kind of really what is the sliding scale of what we're allowed to um, what kind, what are the good and bad things that we allow within that particular excuse me within that particular industry and so in the private world of tiger breeding or private wildlife ownership because there is no specific regulatory body there's not really any way to manage it yes i did mention that the united states department of agriculture does give out permits so um, i think it was it wasn't mentioned in the documentary but at one point two of the characters, I can't remember which ones, were sitting in front of a sign. And the sign that they're sitting in front of is for a roadside zoo in Louisiana. And I've been to that zoo, it's called the Tiger Truck Stop. I think it's in Gross Teat, Louisiana. Um, anyways, the, the guy there has had a huge number of problems and they're all USDA violations, but he basically has this permit that was given to him by the United States Department of Agriculture and he's got numerous violations, but regulatory process to, um, ensure that he's taking care of these animals is not consistent. It's not nearly as rigorous as maybe even getting your driver's licenses, for example, and it certainly isn't as rigorous as things that we see in the livestock industry. And so the problem with that specifically, because there's no governing body to regularly maintain or to regularly uh, monitor this type of interaction, that means that private wildlife ownership is effectively like a cesspool for unregulated breeding, it is a, pro a place where sales of animals is not regulated. Um, so if you're familiar with like North American wildlife conservation laws, we have a law called the Lacey Act. And that means that wildlife can't cross state boundaries. So meaning that if you have a wild animal in Texas, it is legally, you're not illegally allowed to put it in your car and take it over to Oklahoma. That violates that law. But without a governing body for private tiger ownership, for example, there's not really any kind of regulation that monitors that very closely. Um, there's also a lack of, you know, uh, maintenance around medical care. Um, we didn't see any medical care uh, in, in Tiger King, and these animals are in, you know, they live in cages, they live in captivity. Uh, the only time that we did see an animal um, anywhere near any kind, any kind of medical care was when Joe Exotic was anesthetizing tigers in the middle of the night to put them into trucks to transfer them across state lines to sell them for private profit. Um, and what we saw there was, uh, uh, Joe Exotic without gloves, um, as a net tiger is literally being rolled through like a tractor, he's adding more anesthetic to the cat and there's no one there to monitor the heart rate. There's no, monitor, no one monitoring the body temperature. Um, yes, he's reporting the number of CCs that he gave, but he's estimating the time that the animal will be anesthetized. So not only is that an instance of, of you know, really defunct medical care, but it's also an issue of uh, um, really, really poor um, human safety. And, you know, like when I worked at the Tiger Sanctuary uh, in North Carolina, they had a cat um, spontaneously wake up after a dental procedure and, and bust through uh, a vehicle. And, you know, so that's not even the same example, but it is an example of where things can go wrong. And in, in the wildlife work that I've done, a lot of different animals respond differently to anesthetic. And, um, Raccoons, for example, respond really poorly to a drug called telazol, and telazol is the anesthetic that I use to uh, put my bobcats to, uh, to sleep temporarily when I was doing research. But raccoons could just spontaneously wake up like Frankenstein, like they're laying there sleep, asleep and all of a sudden they just sit right up. And, you know, you have to be prepared for that because you could, you know, lose the use of your hand or, you know, the animal can get hurt or something like that. And that's just a simple example of without regulations, we basically see uh, these types of interactions, these treatments up to the jurisdiction of the owner. And at least I think maybe we can all agree that, you know, not owners, not all owners are created equal. Um, 
you know, it, with regards to not not having regulated uh, regulatory bodies, again, you know, we've got the, the sales, we've got the uh, the medical care issues, but we've also got um, how do we regulate issues with violations? If someone comes out there and sees that these people are are, are are violating some of these laws or violating animal welfare or husbandry, they maybe get a citation, but where is the scale in terms of where when you lose your license to own a tiger? Uh, it seems to be, I don't really, I'm not an expert on that, so I won't speak on it too much, but it seems like if you look at some of these facilities, like the one in South Carolina with Doc Antle, he's had numerous violations, yet he still has tigers. Um, and so all of this essentially leads to, uh, we've got private ownership that results in unhealthy cats, whether it's because they're exploited, they're underfed, or they're sold. Um, it, you know, there's no way to regulate if an individual has the ongoing fitness to actually own these animals. Um, and so that's a huge problem. That's something that's never discussed in Tiger King. It's just, yeah, I've got a tiger and this is how we're running our business. Um, and sorry, I'd probably diving down the bunny trail, so I'll move on a little bit. Um, I think the thing that was the hardest for me about this is that Tiger King had tons of footage of, of blatant and uh, intentional as well as neglectful animal abuse, but the only time it's really discussed is in the background or it's not even discussed it uses b footage you know so like in in filmmaking you've got you know basically like the the focus which is currently here me on zoom but if there was something going on in the background or something that was you know played as i was talking that would be considered b-roll or b footage and so many instances of animal welfare violations in this film uh were all b-roll it was all b footage and no one ever discussed it and you know it, that was what was really infuriating to me because even if we don't know, even as a, even if as a viewer you don't know what makes a good facility or a bad facility, we still see like specific animal or instances of animal abuse which are really problematic. And for me, both as a biologist and someone who works with cats, but more specifically as someone who grew up on a farm and worked with. Uh, rescued wild cats at an accredited sanctuary the most egregious thing on the entire film and if you saw my my thread you definitely saw my opinion on this is when joe exotic has the camera up on a birthing box for one of his tigers and she is laboring and she literally has just given birth to a tiger cub this tiger cub is still you know has mucus mucus all over its body she hasn't even really had time to lick it clean to make sure its airway is clean and joe exotic is is taking like a, a 10 foot metal rod and basically rolling this tiger cub out of the birthing box and rolling it across the ground so he can pick it up and manhandle it for the camera um you know there is there's absolutely no medical need for that it's absolutely needlessly cruel and the tigress couldn't do anything about it because she's literally still in the middle of contractions because she's not done giving birth to her litter um and that is just i mean I, I don't there aren't really appropriate words for me to describe how enraging that is and if you watch it too then obviously you are i'm assuming you probably feel the same way but to explain it obviously the only thing he's trying to do is he's sexing the kittens or the cubs so he pulls it up he lifts the tail tells the camera it's a or a girl and then the, the film cuts to uh all of these tiger cubs being inside in a human uh like playpen and he's complaining that they're crying they're crying for their mother they're crying because they're hungry they're crying because they're not having contact so we see this you know this uh disregard for animal life and that's something that really matters is it something that we talk more about in uh, uh animals in captivity than we talk about in wildlife conservation because wildlife conservation is about managing populations not individuals but when it comes to animals in captivity or treating a wild animal in any capacity, you're always concerned about individual welfare. Um, and obviously we don't see that at all in, in, in Tiger King. Um, other things that are hugely problematic from that standpoint with private ownership is that a majority of the pens are overcrowded, particularly the feeding pens. Uh, you know, I, again, I said I worked on a farm, you know, we did not corral animals for feeding or even for vaccinations, the way that I saw tigers routinely shifted into these pens to eat. We're talking about apex predators. They're you know, 300, 400, 500 pounds. Um, they're territorial, they are aggressive, they don't always share food well. And so when you're putting those types of aggressive animals in a pen together, you're asking for a fight. Um, not only, be, not just because the animals are mean and they want to, you know, like rough each other up, but they're also defending one another. So even though you see B-roll of these animals that are fighting, ultimately wildlife alter, wildlife uh, interactions and altercations are based in fear. Um, and so it might be a territorial dispute or a resource dispute in the wild, but when an animal is interacting like that, when two animals are interacting aggressively, 
it's resulting in, you know, the fight or flight syndrome that we always talk about, right? And it's still going to be a huge surge in cortisol. It's going to result in fear-based responses. Um, and so forcing an animal to do, to do that is not considered good animal husbandry. It's not good animal welfare. And it's certainly not good care for, you know, apex predators or, or any, any wild animal. Um, I saw tons of examples of inadequate care of cats. Uh, I already mentioned the anesthetization issue. Some of the up close scenes were cats that had scratches all over their face. Uh, there was one cat, um, one tiger that kind of like came up in the screen. And at first I thought that he had mange, like sarcoptic mange, which we see in like domestic dogs, we see it in wildlife. It's where, you know, the mites burrow under the skin and cause a lot of, looks like dry, itchy, um, uh, like, sandy texture to their skin what i was actually seeing was tons of scars all over the nose like the rostrum the nose and the face of this tiger and the, the sanctuary that i worked at uh zoos that um you know i've been to my friend my colleagues that work at sanctuaries you don't see cats like that that's not normal wild tigers don't look like that granted yes you know i've uh worked with wild cats and we've captured bobcats that have scratches which is evidence from like a fight here or there but we're talking about like systematic regular exposure to altercation and that's really problematic um and let's see i think that's everything for that for that particular point and you know so we're basically seeing no regulations we're seeing blatant abuse but you know that and they're all related but we're talking about adult tigers here we haven't even started talking about the babies um other than the birthing instance um the particular thing that tiger king really failed to d discuss, and that's really problematic for conservation. It's problematic for, um, uh, you know, pe everyday everyday people in everyday situations. Is the huge prolific instance or the huge prolific problem that's associated with cub petting, and you know, baby animals are cute, man. Like tigers are awesome. I, you know, I worked at the tiger sanctuary, and I cannot tell you how badly I wanted to go in there and like cuddle with those tigers. I mean, they seem friendly, they're snuggly, they rub on the fence, they they talk, they chuff at you, they seem to be very social, they make eye contact. Um, we didn't do any of that because, you know, good fences make the best neighbors, right? You know, tiger's really, really friendly until he decides to eat you or and he accidentally like rips your throat out, which is a huge possibility, um, which as a side note is why we see Joe Exotic carrying a firearm in like every single scene. Um, but the problem with cub petting is that it requires regular, it requires a regular supply of cubs. And in order to have a regular supply of cubs, you have to have consistent breeding. So we talk about, you know, puppy mills being a problem. This is the exact same thing. And when we have a chronic, we have a constant supply, we have to have a constant supply of cubs because animals that are, you can't hold and cuddle and bottle feed animals over a certain weight. And so we always have to have cubs. And what that means is we have animals that are chronically stressed, they are chronically exhausted, and they're usually chronically ill. And so when we see uh, instances of like the roadside malls, or we see, I'm sorry, not roadside malls, the, uh, the pay to pet things that at malls when like Joe Exotic was traveling around to different malls, or we see, you know, when he had on facility, big sizes as tiger cubs, you know, you can come there to pet them. What we're seeing is tiger cubs that are A, taken from their mothers, which we've already discussed, and B, hand raised by humans. And yes, I've worked with tigers that are friendly, and they're friendly because they're social animals. Uh, they have a complex uh, social inner system. They have, even though they're solitary animals, they're not like lions, they do have um, a, so a level of sociality that humans effectively can exploit when they're hand rearing these animals. But what you're seeing is a tame animal. You're seeing an animal that's dependent on another species, a human, for its resource needs. Um, you're not seeing an animal that loves you in the same way that I hope my cat, my domestic cat loves me or my dog loves me. Um, but you know, the difference between those two species is domestic cats, domestic dogs, we're talking about thousands of years, 10,000 10, years of uh, uh, domestication for cats and I think 45,000 years of domestication for domestic dogs. Um, and so putting cats in a pen and hand raising them and bottle feeding them doesn't make them uh, friendly or safe in the same way that we see this result of cohabitation with like domestic cats and domestic dogs. Um, and, and so with that being said, we're forcing these animals into this human lifestyle. We're forcing them out of a natural sleep cycle. So if you've ever had a puppy or a kitten or seen cute pictures of or videos of baby animals on the internet, they spend a lot of time sleeping. And you know, cubs are absolutely no different. They spend a lot of time sleeping. Um, you know, we joke about how much like adult wildcat sleep 
you know, so obviously it makes sense that the little ones would also need that much sleep developmentally, but then they would, that's also part of their, their natural history and their behavior. Um, and so when we're, we're having these pay to pet experiences, even if you have 12 cubs and you're only having them out for two hours at a time, they're still in this holding pattern. They're still being passed around. They're being held under their arms and shifted around. They're being fed um, a milk diet much longer than they need to. They're being exposed to artificial light. They're being exposed to camera flashes. They're being held and manipulated in different ways because people don't, no person really knows how to you know, hold a cub. You don't hold it like a baby. You don't scruff it and, hit and hold it around. Um, and realistically what we see is we see adult tigers that end up with metabolic bone disease. And they end up with that disease as a result of being bottle fed for too long. Um, you know, tiger cubs naturally are going to wean around, uh, they're going to start eating solid food around like eight weeks. Um, and they're going to continually drop off their uh, milk intake from their mother as she starts bringing them more food and finally cuts them off and says, you know what? Nope, I'm done with this. I'm not, I'm not, you know, providing milk for you anymore. It's solid food from here on out and you got to start learning how to hunt so then you can survive on your own. Um, but tiger cubs in captivity are bottle fed for, like 12 weeks and sometimes even longer and essentially they're bottle fed until they get too big to be safely interacted that for the public to safely interact with them um and so in addition to metabolic bone disease i've read some things about and i don't know if this is true it would make sense to me that some tiger cubs have issues with uh, eye development as a result of flashes um, I mean, their other vision is so much better than ours. I wouldn't be surprised if that was a problem. Um, we also see like a lot of injuries as they're being handled. We see chronic diarrhea a lot. Um, there's been like undercover instances where, you know, cubs are at zoos and someone's like just wiping their back end to try to get the diarrhea wiped away. Um, and so basically what it boils down to is that, you know, these developmental issues and these um, cruelty issues result in the fact that anybody who's ever done a pay to pet experience, um, whether it's with a tiger cub or you've ridden an elephant or you've paid to, I don't know, feed any, any given wild animal on any vacation or any private zoo that you've attended realistically and unfortunately your participation in that activity supports animal abuse somewhere along the line. Maybe those people love the cat, but in order to get the cat you have to do all the things that we've already talked about, which is hugely problematic. Um, and I think people will talk about this in the comments, I'm not going to go into this too much, but I think the pro another problem that I saw with uh, this documentary is that with all that being said, it's really difficult to then identify who the bad guys are, who, who are the actual bad people. And actually I'll combine points four and five um, because I wanna keep one short so we can actually get to, to, to asking questions and interacting on this. Um, but Tiger King did a really great job of vilifying big cat rescue. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna monologue at all on any of like the ongoing or the past issues surrounding uh, Carol Baskin because I'm not particularly interested in that as it relates to tiger conservation. But the problem with focusing so much on that is um, someone on Twitter posted, I think it was like David Schiffman, I think you're on here, so hi. I think you posted a poll poll about uh, it was the results of a poll that people had answered with regards to who is the villain in or who are the villains in Tiger King and overwhelmingly people had unfavorable opinions of Carol Baskin and they thought she had she was an egregious character um, in this entire story and that really blows my mind because when I was working at Carolina Tiger Rescue one of our uh, models and organizations we worked with was Big Cat Rescue and I was there in 2009 2010 so it's been a long time I don't speak for them these are my own opinions obviously um, but I want to make that clear uh, Big Cat Rescue does great stuff you know their pens are very large um, their facility is much larger than that of Joe Exotics their animals are not on concrete they are in completely natural environments uh, as natural as can be in captivity obviously they're fed whole diets there is very limited uh, exposure and interaction with people and they take good care to make sure that animals that have um, uh, specific problems are not on a tour route or not able to be visited. Um, like case in point, the tank shore that I worked at, we had a tiger named Vincent who um, hated men with beards, hated men. I mean, he, uh, he, we're talking like launch himself across the enclosure and would launch his body up against the fence like 10 feet in the air. Um, so he was, a pri he was a cat that had been in private ownership something bad happened to him and the person who did something bad to him had a beard. So Vincent wasn't on the tour route. Nobody could see Vincent except for people that worked there. Um, and we had one guy on staff who had a beard and he didn't go around that animal because it triggered Vincent, obviously. Um, 
And so you don't see any of that. That's not discussed at all in the documentary. And that's certainly something that Joe Exotic doesn't do. Um, and, you know, private roadside zoos are not involved in policy uh, development like Big Cat Rescue is. And I think that's something that's really worth discussing because that organization works really hard to kind of bridge the gap between captive wildlife ownership and uh, wild tiger conservation. And that really brings me to my last point, and then I'll open it up. I said I was going to do 10 minutes. Um, thanks for not cutting me off, Sarah. I feel like it was like a cool <laughs> thing to drag me here any second. Um, you know, realistically, the, all of this being said, Tiger King didn't give us the tools to understand how do you identify a facility that is doing good work. After watching this, you know, it makes me wonder, oh, my goodness, you know, what are the problems, like, what are the problems with state zoos? What are the problems with like accreditation processes? How am I supposed to figure out, um, you know, what is a good and a bad facility? And I think that realistically, you know, with the vilification of, of Big Cat Rescue and glossing over all these issues, the, re the, the viewer is not left empowered at all. And because, you know, Big Cat, I'm sorry, because Tiger King really showed us just how, uh, easy it is for the public to financially um, and emotionally support this type of exploitation, we really need to have the tools to figure out where we're going to throw that support in order to ensure that captive animals are well taken care of, but that also doesn't affect wild conservation as well. And so I've moved away from captive uh, captive work. I don't, you know, I don't work in zoos anymore. I'm not, I'm not qualified to that type, do that type of work anymore because it's been so long. I work with free ranging wildlife. Um, and, you know, we talk about one of the things that they mentioned in the documentary is that there are more tigers in captivity than there are left in the wild. And in a good way, what that means is that we don't have to go right now, if I want to go get a tiger, I'm pretty sure that the tiger that I'm going to buy off Craigslist was probably bred in someone's backyard in Alabama or North Carolina. It wasn't poached from the wild. But that doesn't mean that poaching is not directly impacted by the desire for private ownership. In countries where tigers are, are endemic, poaching for the wildlife trait is still a problem because you have to source your tigers from somewhere, right? Um, and so when it comes down to identifying a good facility, basically we need to be looking for the things that you know are not discussed in Tiger King. And that is, if a facility offers to let you hold a tiger cub or to ride an elephant or to um, feed an animal for money, they're not doing anything for conservation. It, it stinks. It's not, it, you know, it, it's not fun to think that maybe something that we've done in the past could be harmful to individuals, let alone conservation or animals in captivity, but that's the reality of it. Um, and so any facility that is trying to raise money to support their animals or raise money to support conservation does not do that through interaction with the public. It, it, it's it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, you know, a lot of good facilities have accreditation, and I mentioned this in my thread. There's the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums. There's the oh gosh, I'm going to forget the acronym. The Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. Yeah, I think it's GFAS. Is another accreditation process that um, is considered to be of good quality that basically gives a stamp of approval to some of these facilities. Um, but I've had discussions with other colleagues since the documentary came out, and there are plenty of facilities that don't have these accreditations that are doing good work. And so really, and I think it's a great time to open this up for questions to answer specific, uh, to talk about the specifics behind that. But really, it's about identifying what is a good facility, what does it mean for individuals, and then what does that mean for conservation? Although realistically, I think in the case of Tiger King, it's not so much directly linked to wild animal conservation, which is what I do now, it's more directly linked to captive animal exploitation and abuse, which is something that, you know, I'm happy to see that people are concerned about. Um, and, you know, they're obviously related, and there's a lot of problems with it, and I'm going to go on forever, and I'm just going to stop myself in the middle of a run-on sentence so we can start talking about it. Now. Awesome. Thank you so much for all that awesome information. Okay, we've got a pretty interesting question here um, yes. from David Schiffman, actually. So, uh, Doc Antle said that animal rights people are bad and dumb because when you have an endangered species, making more of them is obviously good. Why is he wrong? Right. So that's a great question. And there are two parts of that. The first is about animal rights and the second is about the numbers game. So the first thing that I like to distinguish, talk about a lot is that there's a difference between animal rights and animal welfare. So when we talk about animal rights groups and animal rights activists, the, the, the poster child for that is the organization PETA. Um, you know, PETA is on a lot of bad lists because they've done a lot of shady stuff. Um, PETA believes that, you know, people should not own or eat or interact with animals at all because animals have the same rights to exist as people and that we should infringe on those rights. Um, 
that is different from animal welfare, which does not, you know, as an, someone who's an animal welfare advocate, which I am, they do not believe that it is unethical to um, have, ex I guess, regulated instances in which we uh, have captive wildlife. So in that case, ethical zoos or regulated zoos could fall under that category. Uh, some of the work that I've done in the past, which is trapping and anesthetizing wildlife for conservation research, would fall under that. And animal rights activists would not think that was ethical at all. Um, and so Doc Antle saying that animal rights uh, people are unintelligent and that they are just making the problem worse is conflating two different problems. There's nothing wrong, you know, we should all be animal, animal welfare advocates, care about the husbandry and the treatment um, and the ability for an animal to feel safe and happy and have nutrition and, and um, uh, like cover. Um, but then when it comes to the numbers game, to make that issue separate, animals that are bred in captivity do not contribute at all to conservation unless they are part of what's called a species survival plan. So a species survival plan is something that is regulated by accredited facilities and it's a, it's a species specific program or protocol that is designed to monitor the numbers and the genetic structure of individuals in captivity with the specific intention that this is a population that we are safeguarding and managing in case the same species in the wild goes extinct. So a great example of that would be uh, like the Bengal tiger. So there, are, there used to be, it used to be that we were, con there were considered eight subspecies of tiger across their entire distribution worldwide. And those subspecies are, are regionally specific. So a great example would be that you don't really wanna put a tiger that is genetically a Bengal tiger in Siberia because the different adaptations, the evolution associated with the tiger, you know, evolving in like snow in Russia is going to be different than a Bengal tiger in the Sunderbonds of India. And so that is why we have these stud books that are species specific and these plans are specific around that regulated breeding. But private ownership doesn't account for that. There is no way to trace the genetic pedigree. There's no way to trace the genetic health. What are the individual, like, is, is that animal predisposed to diseases? Was it bred in a backyard in Juarez? And where is the genetic lineage from that group of tigers from? And so, and, and so on. And so realistically, that is a huge problem that um, this documentary failed because it's not a numbers game. It's basically quality over quantity. Awesome. Uh, next question, Holly English would like to know, how do these unaccredited roadside zoos manage to breed so many cubs successfully when animals are kept in such poor conditions? That's a great question. And realistically, I can't answer the specifics of that other than I do know tigers breed really well in captivity. I mean, they're just, they naturally breed. So you put a male and a female in a cage together, they're going to make babies naturally. You don't have to, there's not an artificial insemination program. There's not an in vitro fertilization program for tigers in captivity. Whereas in contrast, other species like the clouded leopard, for example, uh, doesn't breed well naturally. So if you put a male and a female together, they're more, more likely to be aggressive and kill each other. Um, and so other methods for conservation like artificial insemination and in vitro fertilization are more appropriate. Um, tigers, it ultimately comes down to uh, the dr like drivers of sexual and natural selection, right? So, you know, their innate goal is to re you have an um, unneutered male and an unspayed female put together. That female is eventually, uh, she's going to be receptive to that male and they are going to reproduce just like they are likely to attack you. So the idea that putting them in poor conditions eliminates or great conditions eliminates all of their natural instincts is, um, not correct and realistically one of the ways in which we are still able to make it a, or private owners are able to make it a successful business because you can treat them poorly and still get numbers cool um so here's a question that i would really like to know the answer to from uh, an anonymous attendee are all aza accredited zoos and aquariums that offer animal interactions also problematic or can we kind of feel okay about like feeding a giraffe uh, at an accredited zoo Right. I think it's a good question because I think realistically there's two things here. So I'm not an expert on AZA and I definitely don't speak for them, but I have like in discussions with colleagues, like AZA is a stamp, just like GFAS is a stamp. They're not entirely regulatory in terms of like police officers patrolling a unit or something like that, or I don't know, like teachers grading your assignment and monitoring your progress. So it's not quite as, as rigid as that. And so Realistically, not every facility is created equal, even if they have accreditation, which is why I said it's important to look for these instances. However, accredited facilities, you know, 
some people don't like zoos at all, but if you are of the mindset that animals can serve a purpose for conservation, either in terms of the species survival plans or as being an ambassador animals, basically, which means they're ambassadors and representatives for their species. So for people to see them and learn about them and learn why they're important or care about them, uh, kind of have that human connection to understanding conservation. Um, then there are plenty of instances in which these animals do serve a positive purpose. So I think, for example, um, like I've been to a zoo in which they had cheetah ambassadors, and these, these cheetahs are walked every day. These cheetahs are part of the species survival plan, and they were hand reared because they're in captivity. Um, and so they were hand reared, by, hand reared by professionals. I'm not qualified to do that. So I wouldn't be capable of doing that. You wouldn't be capable of doing that. Zoologists and zookeepers with training are the ones that do that to ensure that they are minimizing some of these negative uh, instances as much as possible. But after that happens, you know, animals form pair bonds or, or bonds with other animals, but they also form bonds with humans. And so in a lot of cases, some of these feed, like feeding a giraffe can be two different things. One, it's meeting their resource needs or getting food. Um, they're being desensitized to human traffic in a way that manages their stress, but they're also receiving enrichment. And enrichment is basically like physical, mental, emotional stimulation in a captive setting that kind of keeps an animal from going stir crazy. And so in that case, you know, what I would say that you should look for is like, what are they being fed? How often are they being fed? And what is the purpose? Do they have information about why those drafts are being hand fed? Were they hand raised? Uh, are they uh, pregnant? Are they sterilized? Do they have a disease that means they need more human action, uh, more human interaction, stuff like that. Transparency is realistically going to help you kind of determine, is this an ethical thing? Is there a reason for this other than just my gratification? Cool. Um, so we've got two questions from the Nichols family. One being, um, what is a tiger's normal lifespan and about how many uh, cubs come in a litter? Those are good questions. Um, so in the wild, Tigers live around 12 years. That would be the average. Um, obviously, there's a, some fluctuation around either side of that average, and that's due to like competition, um, natural mortality, an animal being really lucky and being able to live uh, his or her natural life without uh, some of these uh, natural threats that we see. Um, and within a given litter, I want to say three is the average. Um, but there's some fluctuation with that too. That might depend on is the animal genetically more predisposed to have more like more individuals or less like single litters um, or is it a matter of there's not enough resources for that animal? So if you have a, a tigress that's malnourished during pregnancy, uh, all of those embryos might not develop full term. And so maybe she started out with four cubs, but only two make it to full term. Um, either that means they're reabsorbed in utero or you know, some are still born. Okay, um, so Avalon would like to know uh, how you got to where you are, where you went to school, uh, a little bit of about that. Yeah, um, so I'll give you that short and sweet. So my bachelor's degree is in animal science. I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian for a very long time because I liked animals and I worked on a, I grew up and lived on a farm and people who work with animals either owned a farm or they took care of the animals for the people who owned a farm. And um, for me, I thought being a veterinarian seemed like a really great idea to help individual, help animals and also kind of satisfy my desire to work with or to be around them and appreciate them. Um, I did a really cool study abroad in 2008 to Australia where we were learning about the interaction, the interface between uh, livestock and wildlife. And so basically what that means is in Australia, like in the U.S., we have all these cattle stockyards, right? But we don't have to deal with the issue of herds of six foot tall kangaroo bounding through your fields. And so we were learning about interactions like that, like how do Australian farmers and ranchers deal with that? Um, and I remember on this particular day, we were having a lecture about coral reef die off. I know that's a huge jump, but we're talking about wildlife as well. And I was just sitting in that, le in that lecture and I realized that I was more interested in populations than individuals. And so I said earlier, wildlife conservation is about populations. So we we'll obviously care about individual safety and welfare, but when it comes to wild animals, we're interested in large groups of animals so we can make sure the maximum number of individuals are healthy and long lived and meet their resource needs. And so for me, that was a huge paradigm shift. I decided that I didn't want to work with individuals. I didn't want to work. I didn't want to do surgeries like I thought I did. Um, and I switched to wildlife conservation. Um, and I worked as a field biologist for several years to make up for some of the educational deficiencies because having a degree in animal science um, doesn't really adequately prepare you to be a field biologist. It doesn't give you the background in like evolution and ecology that are really needed to be like a well-rounded uh, scientist who understands how wildlife populations are connected to their ecosystems. Um, and so I worked as a research assistant on several projects 
for many years. Um, and from that, I became interested in terrestrial carnivores, and I also became interested in molecular ecology or genetics. And so that is how I did my master's research, which was on looking at uh, bobcat gen population connectivity in Texas uh, as related to landscapes. So how are populations related, and are there particular barriers to their movements? Are highways, you know, do highways mean that cats aren't connected in Texas, or are rivers helping them move? What are the natural landscape variables that you know make them healthier? Um, and that's really realistically like my focus. I'm interested in those types of questions. And so now I'm doing my PhD, uh, which includes some similar questions like that, but we are trying to answer a lot of questions around like the natural history, the evolutionary history and the population structure of snow leopards in Central Asia. Very cool. Um, so Mila would like to know, uh, what's the best way to convince people that these roadside zoos do not support conservation? Multiple owners of these zoos said that they were helping conserve conserving these animals, even though they're making the animals dependent on humans. That's a great question. And the, the main problem with that, I think, is two different things. One, obviously misinformation, but two, it really comes down to like an argument between experts, right? So like, I don't know how, to, it's hard to get around the idea. It's, it's, there's not really like a great way to say, leave it to the experts, because that sounds kind of arrogant, right? Like, you know, I'm, I worked at a tiger sanctuary. I was qualified to do certain things then, but I'm not qualified to do them now. Um, because I'm no longer an expert in that, like, I'm not an active expert in that field. And realistically, people go to school to be zoologists. They go to school and get training under professionals to be zookeepers and to work with their specific like group of animals or specific species. And that involves time, commitment, and education. Everybody and anybody can love wildlife and they should, and it takes all sorts of people. But realistically, at the end of the day, we're not questioning our human doctors when it comes to like doing surgery. So why are we questioning other professionals when they say that this is not how it's done. Um, and so when we have these private roadside zoos, roadside zoos and people are saying, well, I'm the expert too, that's a problem. And at the end of the day, what it comes down to for me, when you're trying to parse out, is it misinformation or not? Who are these people working for? If you are saying you're an expert and that everybody else is against you and everybody else is wrong um, and everyone else is like, everyone else has the problem, then that's a red flag in my eyes. Um, who do you collaborate with? Um, people have asked me a lot of questions about individual sanctuaries or places that claim they are sanctuaries. But if you don't have transparency on the website or even in person, like where do they get their animals? Um, what organizations do they work with? Uh, where do they get their cubs? What do they do with animals when they're injured? Um, do they work with any like any other NGOs? Do they work with government? Do they have an underlying goal? Like why do you have animals in captivity? Is it because you care about uh, ending abuse? Is it because you care about trying to give them the best possible life um, for the rest of their life in captivity? Is it because you're interested in ending exploitation? Is it because you're interested in you know spaying and neutering these animals so they can't like perpetuate the cycle? Um, organizations that are accredited and that are good are doing those things. They're working with like other zoos. They're working with and sometimes funding wild conservation and wild conservation research in order to make it like the world a better place. And that's a pretty way to say it, but realistically, they're not working alone. They're not saying they're the only experts. Um, they're open to training and their records are transparent, whether it's tax records, whether it's medical records, whether it's um, education, all of those things really factor into deciding who is a good facility or not. And I think that if we can, not everybody is willing to go online and do all that research, but going to their website and seeing they're not accredited or going to their location and seeing that the facilities are small um, and trying to ask questions and not getting those basic questions answered, like where are your cubs coming from? Where do they go? Like, why are there only ever babies here? You know, babies grow up. Where are the ones that are grown up? Um, those are all red flags. And realistically, if we can get people to see that it's not just a numbers game, and that um, ha being an expert does require some, you know, some training, then I think that hopefully people would maybe be a little more selective in, in who they um, are willing to give their support to. Cool. Um, I think we only have time for one more audience question. So I'm going to go with this one from Brooke Tully. Um, I'd be interested to hear your suggestions for how big cat conservationists including sanctuaries, including sanctuaries, should put out messages or calls to action on protecting and conserving the species to leverage the Tiger King show's popularity, if you think they should at all at this time. 
like how can we take the popularity of this show and make it um work for us work for the for the good stuff and not just make it all worse right no and that's that's i think so far in like my very small world there has been some evidence of that because obviously like we're here everyone everyone who is here we're having this conversation that we wouldn't have had without tiger king right um and so for that good uh that doesn't mean i'm going to go so far as to thanking joe exotic um and you know all the uh the memes that we see online with regards to you know the, t the television show but i think realistically the way that we leverage this in a meaningful way is that we kind of need to strike while the iron's hot so for example you know when it comes to any kind of policy or any kind of law nothing gets done unless people are loud about it like you know politicians are not likely to support something until we have enough rep enough constituents say hey i care about this this is something that needs to you either need to vote for it or vote against it and so in this case you know the big cat safety act is something that big cat rescue um has has really helped draft helped uh, uh be, they've been on the forefront of the legislation of this bill and this is a bill in the united states that is really that that they're hoping to get into Congress and be voted on. And if it is passed, what it means is that nobody, like not me, not you, not Joe Exotic, can own tigers as a private citizen. Um, and that's great. And so being able to have those conversations now, like leveraging this docuseries would include trying to act on that like supporting that. So if you want to support um, like ethical care of tigers in captivity, supporting that act is a great way to do it. Having conversations like this is really important. I mean, conservation, we talk about like big terms and big things that we have to do, but realistically it boils down to grassroots efforts, right? Like I am a conservationist doing conservation scientist, science, but I am not the smartest, the most important, or even the loudest person in the room who, when it comes to making a difference. Realistically, conservation is about individual people and communities coming together for positive change. And so like none of the things that I wanna do with snow leopards are possible without like the local communities that I work with and the NGOs and the governments and the you know in-country scientists that I work with. And the same applies for tigers in captivity. And so when it comes to making a dent in some of these for-profit businesses, that means not giving them your money. So that means talking to your family members. That means having, you know, adding to the add to the list of uncomfortable conversations that you're gonna have at Thanksgiving, which is hey man, don't go to that roadside zoo. Don't go if you see the advert for that big event at that festival where they're gonna be like letting you pet like baby lions and tigers don't do it. This is why. And so eventually, if we have those conversations, if like one person in your family doesn't do it, where they might have otherwise done it, thinking that it was okay, then we're making a dent and shrinking the impact and we're shrinking the demand for these types of businesses. And then when you add on policy, basically, every if everybody's working together to have those small impacts, we're more likely to have a meaningful impact down the road. Awesome. Um, okay, so we always ask people the same two questions at the end of every session. The first is what's one thing that you wish everybody in the world knew related to what you know about, like what your expertise is in? And then what's something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? Okay, so my one thing that I wish that people knew that I think is super duper cool, it's just a simple like fast fact, it's a great fat, fast fact, it's a great trivia fact, is that the closest living relative of the tiger is the snow leopard. And so a snow leopard doesn't look anything like a tiger. It is, uh, there are five big cats in the world. There's lions, tigers, leopards, jaguars, and snow leopards. So they're all in the same genus. And they're all, they look vastly different, but they have a similar evolutionary history. They share a common ancestor. But the most recent common ancestor of the tiger, um, or the, the tiger and the snow leopard share a most recent common ancestor. The tiger's the largest of the big cats. The snow leopard is the smallest of the five big cats. And that just completely blows my mind. Everything about their pelage and their skulls is totally different. You should look them up, go down the rabbit hole, it's so much fun. It's a great read to learn all about it, um, their evolutionary history. I think that is really interesting. And something that I wish people in general knew. Oh my goodness. Um, that is a really good question. I wish more people, myself included, knew about plants. Plants are awesome. And obviously right now it's spring. If you're like me, your allergies are going bonkers. Your eyes, you just, everything hurts. Like you can't breathe, you can't see. Um, that's because of the natural reproduction, reproductive process of plants. And there are so many different reproductive modes in plants. And there are so many different ways that you can use plants to help wildlife, including planting endemic species in your yard. And I wish everybody knew more about that because it would make the world a better place. <laughs> So uh, there were a lot of questions today that we didn't get to. So where can we find you on the internet? 
Yes, I love talking about this stuff, obviously. Um, I'm sorry I went off on a lot of tangents, but if you want to talk to me more about this, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is biologistimo, I-M-O, but you can also find me on Instagram um, under the same name, but it's actually my full name, so it's Biologist Imaging. Um, my website is also biologistimaging.com, so if you don't have Twitter, you don't have Instagram, you can also contact me through the contact form on my website. I love chatting about this stuff, so come find me and we'll talk. Awesome. And you can find uh, more about our program, Skype a Scientist, at skypeascientist.com. You can sign up for specific sessions with scientists that uh, study things you're interested in. Uh, we're totally free for everybody, but if you can financially support us, that's the only way that we can uh, function. So you can support us at patreon.com slash scientist or paypal.me slash scientist. Thank you for your time, Imogene. This was super, super cool. And thank you, Erin, as always, for signing for us. We really appreciate that you're always here with us uh and uh we will see you uh later this week we are doing a bunch of sessions this week so tomorrow we're talking about uh dinosaur diseases fossils we've got three on wednesday all um centered around the lead up to earth day so we've got plastic pollution climate change and biodiversity um and then thursday we're talking about antarctica and friday we've got two scientists from rockefeller in new york talking about covid19 so that'll be <sighs> sad but but important so uh we hope to see you all later this week uh thanks for joining us today bye guys bye <laughs>